The Romance of Missionary Heroism by John Chisholm Lambert Chapter 22 Among the Cannibal Islands Almost due north of New Zealand, but at a distance of nearly 1,200 miles, there lies embosomed in the midst of the Pacific Ocean a British group of islands of surpassing loveliness, one of the fairest jewel clusters in King Edward's crown. They are about 250 in number, ranging from the size of a large English county to barren rocks which disappear altogether at the highest tides. To the invariable beauty of all volcanic islands in the tropics this group adds the peculiar charms of the coral formations of the Pacific. Mountains clothed in the most luxuriant vegetation toss their fretted peaks high into the air. Great green breakers dash perpetually on the barrier reefs, sending their snowy foam up to the very roots of the coconut trees that fringe the long shining beaches. Inside of the reefs, again, the lagoon lies sleeping, indigo blue where its waters are deepest, emerald green nearer to the shore, but always of such crystal clearness that the idle occupant of a canoe can see far down at the bottom of the white sands, the richly tinted seaweeds, the exquisite coral growths, branching into innumerable varieties of form, and blossoming with all the colors of the rainbow. These are the Fiji Islands, ceded by King Thakombau to Queen Victoria in 1874. King Edward is now the real king of Fiji, but if it had not been for the splendid labors of a band of Wesleyan missionaries, of whom the Rev. James Calvert was the most notable, the possession of Fiji would have brought the British monarch the questionable honor of being a king of the cannibal islands. It was not of Fiji that Bishop Heber wrote, though every prospect pleases and only man is vile. But to these islands, some sixty years ago, the words might very fitly have been applied. Even among the savage peoples of the South Seas the Fijians were notorious for every kind of brutal abomination. Man-eating was not only practiced, but gloried in and gloated over. It had become a lust so overmastering that men were known to murder their nearest relatives in order to gratify the craving for human flesh. To such an extent was it carried on that there were some who could boast of having eaten hundreds of their fellow creatures. Miss Gordon Cumming, in her most interesting book, At Home in Fiji, tells of a row of stones she saw, extending to a distance of two hundred yards, which was nothing else than a cannibal register formerly kept by two chiefs to represent the number of persons they had themselves eaten, each stone standing for a human body. Woe betide the unfortunate crew whose ship drifted on to the reefs of a Fiji island. If they escaped from the cruel breakers, it was only to be dispatched by a club as soon as they reached the shore, and cooked forthwith in a huge cannibal oven. But cannibalism was only one of the many forms of Fijian cruelty. In these fair islands, one might say, the air was always tainted with the smell of blood, for without the sacrifice of human blood nothing of importance could be undertaken. If a war canoe was to be launched, it was dragged down to the water over the prostrate bodies of living men and women who were always mangled and often crushed to death in the process. When a chief's house was being built, deep holes were dug for the wooden pillars on which the house was to rest. A man was thrown into each hole, and he was compelled to stand clasping the pillar with his arms, while the earth was filled in right over his head. At the death of a Fijian of any consequence all his wives were strangled and buried beside him, to furnish what was called lining for his grave. His mother also, if still alive, suffered the same fate, and it was the duty of the eldest son to take the leading part in the strangling of both his mother and grandmother. The lives of more distant female relatives and connections were spared, but they had to express their grief by sawing off one of their fingers with a sharp shell, joint by joint, so that it was hardly possible to see a woman in the islands who had not suffered mutilation in both her hands. In spite of their cruelty, however, the Fijians were a race much superior, both in physique and intelligence, to the majority of the South Sea Islanders. Usually tall and muscular, both men and women sometimes displayed proportions that were quite magnificent. Their social laws were elaborate, and they possessed some of the arts of civilization. As manufacturers of cloth, and especially of pottery, they were famous far and wide in the Pacific, and canoes came hundreds of miles from other island groups to purchase their ware. 
They also enjoyed a unique reputation as wig makers and hairdressers. Every chief had his own private hair artist, who spent hours each day over his master's head. With all kinds of fantastic variations in the particular style, the general idea was to get the hair to stick out as far as possible from the skull, and specially skillful operators were able to produce a coiffure five feet in circumference. Like everything else in this world, however, this elaborate top-dressing had to be paid for, and the payment came at bedtime. It was impossible to lay such a head upon a pillow, much more upon the ground. The Fijian had to rest his neck all night long on a bar of bamboo raised above the floor by two short legs. It was between the thirties and the forties that the first pioneers of Christianity came to Fiji. About 250 miles to the east lay the Friendly Islands, inhabited by a race called Tongans. These Tongans were much bolder sailors than most of the South Sea races, and were in the habit of visiting Fiji periodically for purposes of trade. Eventually some of them settled in the most easterly islands of the group, a fact which led to still closer intercourse. In the Friendly Islands the Wesleyan missionaries had met with remarkable success. The Tongans nearly all became Christians, including their king, King George, as he was called after his baptism. In his heathen days this man had been a famous fighter, leading out his war canoes like some viking of the Pacific, and spreading death and devastation far and near. Now that he was a Christian he was no less zealous in seeking to spread the gospel of peace. Both he and his people were especially anxious that Christianity should be carried to Fiji, and they persuaded the Wesleyans to make the attempt. The Rev. James Calvert was among the pioneers in this dangerous enterprise, the only one who was spared to see the marvelous transformation which passed over the archipelago within the course of a single generation, and can only be compared to the transition that takes place within a single hour in those same tropical regions from the darkness of the night to the glory of the morning. It was in La Kimba, one of the eastern or windward islands, as they are called, that Mr. and Mrs. Calvert first landed. It was a suitable place in which to begin, for here they were in the neighborhood of the Tongan colonies where King George's influence was felt. All the same, they were subjected to a great deal of unkindness, and had to face constant dangers and hardships, especially as Mr. Calvert's district covered not La Kimba only, but twenty-four surrounding islands. Many days and nights had to be spent on the ocean in frail canoes. Many an anxious hour Mrs. Calvert had in Lakemba, alone in the midst of fierce savages, thinking, too, of her absent husband, who might be battling with the storm in a sea full of coral reefs, or standing unarmed in the midst of a throng of excited cannibals. After some years of labor in their first sphere, it was decided that the Calverts should leave the eastern outskirts of the archipelago and make for the very citadel of Fijian heathenism and savagery. In the island of Bao, which lies near the heart of the whole group, there lived at that time an old king called Tanoa, one of the most ferocious of man-eaters, and his son Thakombao, a prince of almost gigantic size and at the same time of unusual intelligence and character. Both the king of Bao and his son were celebrated warriors. In case of need they could summon to their banner many scores of war canoes, and their power to strike was felt all over Fiji. Thakombao was capable of mildness, but with Tanoa bloodthirstiness had become a kind of mania. When he went forth in his huge sailing canoe to demand tribute from surrounding islands, nothing delighted him so much as to exact little children and to sail back to harbor with their bodies dangling from his yard-arms. Once a near kinsman had offended him, and though the culprit begged his pardon most humbly, Tanoa only responded by cutting off the arm of the poor wretch at the elbow and drinking the warm blood as it flowed. Next he cooked the arm and ate it in the presence of his victim, and finally had him cut to pieces limb by limb. He was no more merciful to his own children than to those of other people, and on one occasion compelled one of his sons to club a younger brother to death. With characteristic courage the Wesleyan missionaries determined to strike at the very center of Fijian cruelty, for they knew that if heathenism could be cast down in bow, the effects of its downfall would be felt in every island of the archipelago. On Bao itself Tanoa would by no means permit them to settle, nor would he allow any Christian services to be held in that island. 
he made no objections however to mr calvert's building a house on an islet called viwa which is separated from bao by only two miles of water and he was quite willing to receive personal visits mr calvert had many a conversation with the old king and his son on tanoa he made not the slightest impression but over thakombau he gradually gained an influence which was to lead in due course both to the christianization of the fiji islands and to their incorporation in britain's world-wide empire but it was mrs calvert not her husband who gained the first victory in the fight hospitality was a thing on which king tanoa prided himself and he never failed to entertain important guests with a banquet of human flesh if enemies could be secured for the table so much the better but if not he had no hesitation in sacrificing his own subjects on one occasion a party of envoys from a piratical tribe had come to bow to offer the king a share of their spoil by way of tribute at once a hunting party was sent out under the leadership of ngavindi a notable chief which soon returned with fourteen captures all women woman being considered an even greater delicacy than man in those days the fishing in fiji was nearly all done by the gentler sex and these unfortunates were wading in the sea with their nets when the hunters sighted them creeping up with his men under the cover of a fringe of mangrove bushes which ran along the shore navindi dashed suddenly into the water and seized the screaming women who knew only too well what sort of fate awaited them word of the occurrence came to viwa almost immediately mr calvert was absent at the time on one of his numerous expeditions but his wife and another lady who was with her resolved to do what they could to save the doomed wretches they jumped into a canoe and paddled hastily across the strait before they reached the shore the din of the death drums told them that the work of butchery had already begun every moment was precious now and when they got to land they took to their heels and ran towards the king's house by the laws of bao no woman was at liberty to cross tanoa's threshold on pain of her life unless he sent for her but these two ladies thought nothing of their own danger they rushed headlong into the king's presence and with arms outstretched besought him to spare the remaining victims the very boldness of their action made it successful tanoa seemed quite dumbfounded by their audacity but he at once ordered the work of slaughter to cease nine of the poor women had already been killed and carried off to the ovens but the remaining five were immediately set at liberty there was another custom not less cruel than cannibalism and even more difficult to uproot since it was deeply intertwined with the religious idea of the people and especially with their thoughts about the future life this was the practice already referred to of strangling a man's wives and even his mother on the occasion of his funeral so that their spirits might accompany him into the invisible world as king tanoa was an old man whose end seemed to be drawing near the prospect of his death and what might happen in connection with it gave mr calvert the deepest concern he knew that if fijian usage was adhered to the departure of so great a chieftain from the world was sure to be attended by a wholesale immolation of his womenfolk he also saw that if the practice could be broken down at tanoa's obsequies a deadly blow would be struck at such abominations he therefore visited thakombau the heir apparent again and again and urged him by every consideration in his power to abandon the idea of slaughtering his father's wives he tried to appeal to his better feelings he promised to give him a very handsome present if he would refrain from blood he even went so far as to offer to cut off his own finger after the fijian fashion of mourning if the women might be spared but though thakombau was evidently impressed by mr calvert's pleadings he would give no assurance and mr calvert learned afterwards that all the while tanoa himself had been privately instructing his son that his wives must on no account be kept from accompanying him on his journey into the unseen the old king's death took place rather suddenly in the end and on this occasion too mr calvert happened to be absent on duty in a distant island so that it fell to a younger missionary mr wattsford to take action as soon as he heard of the death he made for bow with all possible haste within tanoa's house and in the very presence of the corpse the work of massacre had begun two wives were lying dead and a third had been summoned when the missionary burst in when Thakombau saw him enter, he became greatly excited, and trembling from head to foot he cried out, What about it, Mr. Wattsford? 
refrain sir mr watsford exclaimed speaking with great difficulty for his emotions almost overpowered him refrain that is plenty two are dead but though thakombau was moved he would not yield they are not many he said only five but for you missionaries many more would have accompanied my father and so the other three victims were brought in newly bathed anointed with oil dressed in their best as if going to a joyous feast and there in the very presence of the white man as he kept pleading for their lives they were put to death in the usual way they were made to kneel down on the floor a cord was fastened round their necks and this cord was gradually drawn tighter and tighter till life was extinct but though king thakombau had not the courage at this time to defy the ancient traditions of his people the influence of a higher teaching had been slowly telling upon him and the day dawn in fiji was about to begin soon after tanoa's funeral a bao chief died and mr calvert was able in this case to persuade thakombau to forbid any sacrifice of the women of the house the usual preparations for murder had already been made and the royal command gave great offence to many the chief executioner flung down his strangling cord and exclaimed then i suppose we are to die like anybody now but a great victory had been won for humanity and christianity a precedent against a brutal custom had been established which made it much easier for all time coming to rescue the proposed victims of superstition and cruelty but the greatest triumph of all came when thakombau resolved to renounce heathenism altogether and take his stand on the christian side in the presence of a vast crowd summoned by the beating of the very death drums which had formerly rolled out their invitation to the islanders to be present at a cannibal feast the king of bau renounced his past proclaimed his faith and declared his intention to live henceforth as a follower of christ that day of eighteen fifty seven was not only a day of gratitude and thanksgiving in the experience of mr calvert and his colleagues but one of the most important days in the history of fiji it was the precursor indeed of another day some seventeen years later when thakombau having applied to be taken under the protection of the british crown formally ceded the fiji islands to queen victoria handing over at the same time to the british envoy his old war club in token of the fact that his people were now abandoning club law and adopting the forms and principles of civilized society thakombau's magnificent club together with his drinking bowl of which he made a present to our queen may now be seen by interested visitors in the british museum innocent as they now look in their museum case it requires some exercise of the imagination to picture forth the awful scenes of massacre and the loathsome cannibal orgies in which that same club and drinking bowl once had their share this book is called the romance of missionary heroism to those who read his story afterwards the heroism and romance of a missionary's life often lies in the faith and courage and tenacity with which he faced toils and dangers even though his endeavors did not result in great outward achievements but there are other cases in which the romance of the missionary adventurer's life appears not only in the trials and difficulties he faces but in the wonderful victories he wins now and then there comes a fortunate knight of christ before whom embattled hosts go down and who wins his way into the city of jerusalem and claims it in his lord's name james calvert was such a happy knight when he and his young wife reached fiji one of his first tasks was to gather up and bury the skulls hands and feet of eighty men and women who had been sacrificed at a single feast all around them day by day deeds of horror went on which might well have frozen the blood of any one who was not sustained by faith in god men and women bound with ropes were dragged past their door going literally like oxen to the slaughter the very air they breathed was foul at times with the sickening odor of roasting human flesh yet they hardly dared to express their disgust and loathing a brother missionary and his wife narrowly escaped from being themselves burnt alive because the lady had ventured to close the window and draw down the blind in order to shut out the sight and smell of what was going on in front of their house on his visits to strange islands too mr calvert always went with his life in his hand and more than once had marvellous escapes from a death that seemed certain but this same missionary who had seen fiji in its midnight gloom was spared to see it in the light of the sun rising he was spared to see the islands provided with thirteen hundred christian churches 
crowded Sunday after Sunday by devout congregations. And where once the stillness of the night had been often broken by the death shriek of the victim, or the cannibal's exultant death song, he was spared to hear, as he passed along the village paths after dark had fallen, the voices of fathers, mothers, and little children rising together from many a home in sweet evening hymns.